Hi, um, my name is Hannah Tiernan. I am an independent artist, researcher, writer and LGBTQ plus rights act activist based in Dublin. Um, the title of my presentation this afternoon is Foul, Filthy, Stinking Muck, the LGBT Theatre of Project Art Centre 1966 to 2000. So as you can imagine, there's a lot to get in, so I'm going to kind of fly straight through it. Um, so Project Art Centre um, began as a three week festival at the Gate Theatre um, under the name Project 67 in 1966. Uh, it hosted visual arts exhibition, children's workshops, concerts, theatre, and most significantly, it conducted a teach in and readings of banned texts by living authors such as Edna O'Brien. Due to cens censorship legislation, Literature and film were officially banned. However, theatre wasn't, which meant that banned texts could be read in public. Orla McBride summed it up when she, when she called it an absurd situation whereby words that could be freely spoken in public could not be read in private. The artists involved uh, were subsequently offered rooms in the Tuck and Company building on Abbey Street, where they set up a cooperative uh, gallery as project. The organization was intended to give artists autonomy over their own work and its dissemination. In 1969, they moved across the road to the basement of the YMCA building and became Project Art Center. They combined space to accommodate visual arts um, um, by day and performance by night. In 1972, they moved to an old warehouse in South King Street, where the Stevens Green Shopping Centre is currently sits. Finally, in 1974, they moved to the current site in East Essex Street, Temple Bar. The building behind the building had been part of the Dollard Printing Works, and the cavernous space allowed them to design a multifunctional one to accommodate two galleries and a purpose-built theatre. During this time, a dedicated theatre co committee was set up, um, which included artists such as Alan Stanford, Tom Hickey and Tom Jordan. In 1976, Jim and Peter Sheridan became co-directors of the theatre programme. They focused on socially engaged works dealing with issues such as the housing crisis, South African apartheid and institutional abuse. In 1977, uh, with grant assistance from the Arts Council, Project were able to buy the building, securing the future of the site. They added a cinema space to the building, uh, showing an extensive variety of art house films, films which otherwise would not have been seen in the city. In 1982, two fires broke out, which massively damaged the main gallery and the cinema. In the 1990s, plans got underway to redevelop the site, along with the overall redevelopment plans for Temple Bar. During the demolition of the building phase, Project relocated its performance space to Henry Place off Moore Street, calling it Project at the Mint. The new building opened in 2000 and is currently the residing building for the Project Art Centre. In 1976, um, among the socially engaged works by the Sheridan brothers, um, or uh, they presented, um, were two plays by London-based company Gay Sweatshop. Mr. X told the story of a man coming to terms with his sexuality, but also the internalised homophobia within the LGBTQ community. Jill, Posner, um, Jill Posner's autobiographical work, Any Woman Can, told the story of her coming out, dealing with her own acceptance and that of her family and friends. Despite appearances, the company essentially operated as two, entirely segregated between the gay men and lesbian women, as, as was much of the culture of the community at the time. There was a huge public outrage over uh, following the presentation of the plays, with Gilbert Hughes describing the plays as foul, filthy, stinking muck. 
As a result of the complaint, Dublin City Council refused £6,000 of funding to the project. Um, This resulted in a campaign to recoup the losses dubbed the Fighting Cock Fund um, due to the centre's logo. As As a part of a fundraising campaign, Gay Sweatshop returned to Dublin at their own expense and performed the plays twice more, donating the proceeds to the fund. However, this time it was they were performed in the Ablana Theatre underneath Bosaris. Despite the complaints, the project did have a fair share of supporters. Chairman of Dublin, City's, Dublin City Council's Cultural Committee, Mr Pat Carroll, wrote, That kind of underhand censorship is the worst course open to any of us. It has no legal backing, no defined ground rules, no appointed censors answerable to Parliament or the courts. It is, sorry, its only criteria are those of the self-appointed, unwanted guardians whose own desire to impose their views on everyone else and to sweep aside the compassionate influence of good plays on public opinion. The Secretary of the Society of Irish Playwrights condemned the decision, claiming that it strikes a blow against the serious artist's right to freedom of expression and must raise considerable alarm for the future of the theatre. Dublin City Council ultimately revoked the decision six months later. They had claimed that the funding had had nothing to do with the plays and was based on the supposed uncertainty surrounding project's tenancy at the site which, as I previously mentioned, was resolved following the Arts Council grant. In 1981, the project presented Martin Sherman's Bent, originally staged in London in 1979, starring Ian McKellen and Tom Bell. It received mixed reception to the theme, but generally it was applauded for its strong production values and script. In 1980, the off-Broadway production starring Richard Gere received criticism from many of its Jewish critics for undermining the severity of the Jewish Holocaust in favour of a homosexual agenda. This was despite Sherman being a gay Jewish American. The play told the story of Max during the Second World War. Following an SS raid on their apartment, Max and his boyfriend Rudy Um, witness a violent political assassination. As a result, they are forced to go on the run. Eventually, the pair are captured for holding hands and are transported to Dachau. In order to receive more favourable treatment by way of wearing a Jewish star, Max denies his sexuality and is forced to kill Rudy. In the concentration camp, camp, Max befriends Horst, a known homosexual who wears the pink triangle. The two form a relationship, however, they are not allowed any physical contact. During a break uh, on their work detail, they are forced to stand to attention. As they stand side by side, they verbally fantasize about having sexual or having sex, resulting in them orgasming. When Horst is executed, Max is instructed to bury him. After lowering the body into the grave, Max jumps in and puts on Horst's coat with the pink triangle. He then kills himself by jumping against the electrified fence, ultimately dying as a proud gay man. The Diamond Body was a collaborative experimental work by Operating Theatre, which relied heavily on the performance, uh, sorry, relied as heavily on the performance as on the script music and lighting. The show was written by Aidan Carroll Matthews um, with music by Roger Doyle. The one person role was performed by Olin Ferreri. The play centred around the body of Stefano, a hermaphroditic owner of a gay nightclub on a small Greek island. Ferreri played the part of Stefano's male friend and lover who recounts the events surrounding his death whereby the local community had conducted a mass act of violence upon Stefano. Apart from addressing an LGBT theme, the work proved interesting due to the approach taken to the performance. 
Although it's not uncommon to have actors portray characters of the opposite sex, the conventional approach tended to simply exaggerate gendered characteristics. Fuari, however, um, was lauded for impressing the attributes of a man upon her character and yet allowing the androgyny brought on through her own gendering to remain evident. Fuari expressed her rationale for playing the androgynous role as wanting to avoid women's politicising as a theme. 1987 saw the presentation of Larry Kramer's The Normal Heart. First produced in New York in 1985, it told the story of AIDS activist Ned Weeks and his struggle to raise awareness for, of the disease, fighting government bureaucracy and social stigma. Set in New York between 1981 and 1984, during the first years of the epidemic's outbreak. During the course of his activism, Weeks forms a relationship with New York Times journalist Felix, who subsequently dies from the disease. The work was obviously heavily politically charged, and a poster on the set of the Project Art Centre's staging read, AIDS is God's wrath, only if cancer, diabetes, heart disease, or other diseases people suffer from are all signs of God's wrath as well. The play was received positively when it was shown at Project, and despite being one of the most critically, most critical reviews of the production, David Nalen wrote, the first thing to be said about Michael Scott's production of Larry Kramer's The Normal Heart is that it should definitely be seen. The play is the first to have treated homosexuality and homosexual relationships without either coyness or sentimentality, and the first to have tackled the problem of AIDS. As much as the normal heart was a direct response to current events, so too was sea urchins. It was directly inspired by the death of Declan Flynn in Fairview Park in 1982. Flynn was attacked by four men and one youth. They were found guilty of manslaughter. However, they were awarded suspended sentences by the judge. Their defence claimed that they were ridding the area of the dangers of homosexuality. The verdict resulted in a protest march from Liberty Hall to Fairview Park. The march is commonly acknowledged as being the city's first pride march and the catalyst for the consolidation of the strengthening, consolidation and strengthening of the country's gay liberation movement. Six years on, Aidan Madden's play was a direct reaction to the events surrounding Mr. Flynn's death. Set on Dunleary Pier, it told a similar story of a group of queer bashing youths fueled by cider who were given suspended sentences following a fatal attack on a gay man. The play was the first work to respond directly to an Irish event and to tell an Irish story, although it could, have tra although it could translate universally. Journalist Theresa Brogan described the play Tangles as taking on the issues of homosexuality in an upfront, non-sensational, non-judgmental and, dare I say, entertaining way. The play was devised by the company Wet Paint Arts under the direction of David Grant, director of programming with Dublin Theatre Festival. The company developed works uh, for a youth audience in consultation with youth groups. The play was loosely based on Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. It looked at uh, the struggles faced by a young man coming out. The character, Kevin, is coming to terms with his sexuality and through the course of a uh, farcical series of events, ends up coming out to his friends. There were a number of themes explored in the play, primarily homophobia through the character of Tangles. Tangles, the play's antagonist, was said to have reflected much of the bullying climate of fear surrounding homophobia at the time. Another of the themes explored was that of Kevin's friend Lorcan and his uh, and his discomfort with having a gay friend and how it might reflect on him. As the events unfold, 
Kevin manages to change his mindset um, and his friends, but also to an extent that of Tangles. The 1991 presentation of Neil Bartlett and Nicholas Bloomfield's Saracen, told by La Zambanella, a 260-year-old castrato singer. He recounts the story of his once upon a time lover, Jean Ernest Saracen, who assumes La Zambanella to be a woman. The mistaken identity is not unfounded, as the eunuch's character is portrayed um, as a seductive woman. Loosely, loosely based on a Balzac story, in his review, Aver Walsh described, the notion of gender reversal and the confusion and ambiguity of sexual identity as brilliantly evoked. This work was undoubtedly one of the first to give visibility to a largely unrecognised transgender narrative. I Know My Own Heart was one of the first lesbian themed plays uh, to be performed at Project Since Gay Sweatshops Any Woman Can six, 17 years previously. Written by Emma Donoghue, it was based on the diaries of Anne Lister, the Yorkshire heiress. She was known to, for her unconventionality, wearing boots, keeping her hair short, travelling unchaperoned and refusing to marry. It told the story of her three love affairs with Marianne, Tib and Marianne's sister, Nancy. Although Marianne was Lister's true love, she was forced to marry for financial reasons resulting in Anne having affairs with Tib and Nancy. Originally presented as part of Glass House's Acts and Reacts Festival, the festival aims, aimed to promote women's voices in theatre. The festival took place over two venues, Project Arts Centre and the Irish Writers Centre. It launched, launched on International Women's Day on the 8th of March and ran for nearly two months concluding with a 10-day run of the play, presented as a one-act lunchtime play during the festival. 1996 saw the presentation of two LGBT-themed works. The first was Jared Stembridge's The Gay Detective. Set on the eve of decriminalisation, it, <laughs> it is essentially a murder mystery featuring, featuring the character of Pat, the gay detective in question. With regards to its reception, it was generally favourable. However, playwright Hugh Leonard gave a scathing review and admittedly with some bias wrote, Watching the play, I began to wonder if I had given up enjoying myself for Lent. Gay plays make me uneasy. So-called straight drama does not usually consist of two hours of simulated buggery and anal rape and blowjobs and messing and smugging and groping. He goes on to ask, why, one wonders, are gays so utterly obsessed with sex as to suggest that they have reinvented it? Do they ever have a quiet night at home? The biggest controversy, however, over the play's lead, over the play's lead act, actor sharing a gay kiss on stage. The actor, Peter Hanley, had recently taken a beloved role in the Irish soap opera Ballycus Angel. Needless to say, this didn't make it much further than the news of the world. The second play um, at, uh, uh, sorry, the second play that year was Emma Donoghue's work, Ladies and Gentlemen. Once again, it was based on a historical character. This time it was Annie Hindle, a male impersonator from the 1980s. The play is recounted through a series of memories um, of Hindle uh, convincing a minister to marry her and her lover, Anne Ryan. The couple lived together as husband and wife until Ryan's death. Befittingly, the last LGBT themed work to be presented at Project prior to the reopening of the new building was Poor Superman, produced by the first national gay and lesbian co theatre company. Originally started as Wild Theatre Workshop in 1991, they went on to become Muted Cupid in 1992. The company's focus was on producing gay work, sorry, producing work by gay and lesbian writers, 
using primarily gay and lesbian practitioners. The play centred around David, an artist who begins working as a, as a waiter. He develops an attraction for his married boss, Matt, to the amusement of the sporting characters, Kryla, his single, his straight friend, and Sharon, his transsexual flatmate, who has AIDS. There are reasons for choosing the production, choosing to produce Poor Superman by Canadian playwright Brad Fraser was <clears throat> because the equality within the characters it portrayed. It was not a gay play per se, um, but a play with gay characters. The characters are not ghettoized, nor the straight, sorry, the gay characters are not ghettoized, nor the straight characters marginalized. All are given equal consideration. The choice to present work, um, the choice to present the work underpinned by a visible equality between its characters was a testament to how far the LGBT rights movement had come over the preceding decades. Thank you very much.